Good to see you. So John, uh, we're really glad that you're here and uh, interested in hearing a little bit of your story. To get us started, um, tell me who uh, Joseph Coney is and what's the LRA? So some of you will know of Joseph Coney from a film that went viral in 2012. So Coney 2012 um, at that time, and I believe maybe still was the most uh, watched um, uh, viral video um, put together by one of the founders of Invisible Children. So the LRA uh, sadly stands for the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, Joseph Coney is the leader of the longest running rebel war in Africa still today, although his numbers are greatly reduced by the Contra LRA efforts. Hmm. How did you first come to know of Coney or the LRA? In, uh, well, just 10 years ago, um, I had uh, a member of my staff who was the head of our foundation came into my office, and she was holding a copy of our mission statement. And on it, it says, uh, our core mission is, to, is peacemaking, reconciliation, and ending genocide. And she had the question, so how serious are we about ending genocide? And I said, it's a life calling of mine. I'm very serious about it. And he said, she said, if that's true, there are five things I think we need to do. She had a list. Uh, and uh, one of the things on the list was to take a trip to Africa. Um, she was shocked walking out of the um, office. She said she thought this was going to take a, a process to um, convince me uh, to do. Uh, I told her, uh, make the reservations. It's not usual that I make decisions on the spot and without consulting my wife. <laughs> um, but it was on that trip in 2005 uh, that I learned more about the Lord's Resistance Army. We took a, a trip to uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. And while I was in Uganda, we flew um, to Gulu and Kitkum in the north where the LRA were still active. So what is the, what's the mission behind the LRA? Why are they fighting? Uh, you know, if you read the literature, uh, it's very unclear. So, um, and, and, the, and the, uh, the title, Lord's Resistance Army, is mixed up with spiritual things, including stuff about the Ten Commandments that just gets so far off track, um, it's hard to know. My understanding, uh, really, in, in studying this is it's simply uh, a guy who's, who's got a lot of power, he likes the power, and um, has a lot of wives and people that are, um, so I, I would have to say it's primarily just about power and keeping power. And what, uh, what countries is the LRA active in today? Well, that's been one of the hard things. Uh, originally, it was in northern Uganda. The Ugandan forces got very seriously about pursuing them, and so the Lord's Resistance Army uh, left and has been active in at least five other countries. Um, and uh, they were hired by one country to serve as a surrogate rebel force against insurgents in their country. It gets very complicated um, and very difficult for the Ugandan forces or African Union forces even to pursue him across these other um, boundaries because they're sovereign rights of those countries. You can't take an army and just walk into another mm -hmm. country. So that's been part of how he's uh, evaded. Those so you, forces. you said that genocide was sort of a sense of life calling or ending uh, yes. genocide. When did you first develop that understanding? Um, wow. Uh, my first um, intellectual thoughts about genocide were uh, studying the Holocaust in eighth grade history class. So that's when I date back uh, just thinking about it and uh, it was a situation where I had an understanding of war, um, but no understanding of why people would try to eradicate a whole people group just on the basis of their race or, or religion or just because of who they were, not because of something that they had done. That was a major uh, disconnect for me. And, and, uh, but, but my thought at the time was at least never again. I really believed that now that the world knew about the, the concepts of this, that it would not happen again. I was 19 years old when the genocide in uh, Cambodia happened, uh, which was uh, another disconnect. So, that started me off on getting more serious about um, doing something about genocide. Was this when you were an undergrad at Swarthmore? Yes. What were you like as a college student? <laughs> I was. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that laugh, John. Yeah. Um, so my freshman year um, uh, was Watergate. I was not yet a, a follower of Jesus at that time. 
And um, that was a big disconnect based on my family of origin. I felt um, uh, betrayed by the president of our country. Uh, and I grew up in a very patriotic, um, very supportive of this president home. Um, and to learn the things that were lied about and the, the way decisions were uh, made was a, I had to re-examine all the things that I had um, understood growing up as a child, and part of those were faith things. So that's partly, I think, how I became um, a follower of Jesus uh, in that time. Swarthmore is a Quaker-founded college. I was attending Quaker meetings my freshman year. Um, I was probably an average student um, through those years. Um, my wife, my now wife, uh, who knew me those times, would have said I was a little scary. I had an afro kind of like out to here and was tall and but friendly. <laughs> um, so while you're uh, an undergrad, um, you uh, come to know Jesus? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, well, you know, people ask questions like this and you have a, like an understanding. Um, so I'll give you my kind of understanding about it. But sometimes I think, uh, I think of the answers that we give to significant life questions like that. And I, I picture, or spe I mean, this is really true if you're, if you're successful in some area of your life, which if you got to Gordon, you probably are successful in some area of your life. So I think uh, this should resonate with your students as well. But I have the thought of, you know, you're, you're talking about your life as if you're taking credit for it. And I picture God, you know, somewhere looking down and like, you did what? <laughs> so um, that's uh, a view of um, success. But your specific question, though. was about your, how you came to faith. Yes. I grew up in a Unitarian uh, home. That was an important part of my uh, growing up. My mom is now a Unitarian minister. That wasn't true. That became true in her 60s. That wasn't true while I was growing up. Um, but a quest for knowledge and truth uh, was in my fabric. Um, I studied the Bible for the first time in college. I had some friends that uh, told me the specific aspects of the gospel. I grew up in the Bible Belt, and I'd actually never heard that before. I don't know how I didn't hear that, but I really don't think I had. Um, and so took seriously the questions of um, faith and salvation and the teachings of Jesus, uh, especially around peace, really resonated with me. Hmm. Hmm. So um, then you ended up going to grad school, uh, getting a degree at both MIT and at Harvard. Yes. And uh, then how did you decide to go into the world of finance? That was an unusual path. So um, for... Uh, probably 13 years after I graduated um, from my uh, MIT engineering degree. I was in the transportation industry. I went back <laughs> at age 25. I was um, in business uh, managing a small bus company, and I quickly realized I didn't know anything about business, so I went back and got an MBA. There, I took a few courses in finance, just kind of on a lark. It's like, well, I'm here. It's kind of expensive to be here. Um, I'll take some finance courses. My grades said I should have gone to Wall Street. I didn't have any inkling to go to Wall Street, so I was still in the transportation industry, but I started doing investments as a hobby, and at age 37, decided to make my hobby my profession, which is a little unusual to actually start a business in an industry where you've never worked before, which was true for me. And uh, how'd you do in the early years? In the early years, we did great for our shareholders, but not so well for ourselves, uh, as in our performance record was good, but our assets under management didn't cover the cost of the business. So John Montgomery's business plan had us breaking even in 12 months. Um, by the PS in, in business school, I didn't take a single course in entrepreneurship, or I would have known that was probably very unrealistic. Um, it took three years before we got to the break-even point, only in the last third year by an amazing blessing, a breakthrough in um, in marketing and public relations. Um, so that was the first, uh, the first period of starting Bridgeway. So I know that in the world of finance, there's lots of different things that uh, you can be involved in. How would you describe Bridgeway Capital? Um, so most of you are familiar with mutual funds. This is a, a way of uh, just normal investors with small amounts of money pooling their uh, investments in, a, in an instrument called a mutual fund. 
um, and uh, that's a way to diversify versus just investing uh, directly. So that's the lion's share of what Bridgeway does. So uh, I'm going to invite you, if you have questions you'd like to ask John, uh, feel free to text or email those questions to me, and I'll incorporate them in. And I've actually already gotten one question. Somebody knew that we were going to ask for it. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about regrowing the afro, John? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think so. Um, my first marketing guy, like in the very beginning, said I, I didn't want to put a title on my business card. And, and uh, he said, you know, like when you're, six, when you're far enough along, you can wear tennis shoes if you want to to work. But right now, you can't do that. So I'm not sure my investors probably would... Go for the Afro. Probably go for the Afro. Okay. So um, how did you come to the conclusion that you wanted uh, a significant portion of the money that your company makes to go to fund philanthropy? Um, I'll have to say, I do not recommend this as a principle, but in my life, in some key decisions, naivete has worked amazingly well for me. Um, I was 21 when I got married, um, and uh, I had this amazing life partner. I mean, she's really, we're in our 38th year of marriage to celebrate next month. Great. Um, that would be, yep. Great. Um, but I can't say I knew a lot about marriage or I, I was in love with a woman, and I wanted to, I just felt it was time to get married. And she said yes the second time I asked her. She said no the first time. Oh, note to self. <laughs> note to self. Okay. Um, so naivete. Um, also, uh, so in starting a business, the conversation went like, I'm thinking about starting a business that's low cost. Um, it should generate a lot of money if it's successful, as I had been doing as a hobby. Uh, what would you do with all that money? And I actually had a concern that, um, that having too much money would suck me into a lifestyle that I didn't really aspire to, either just as an individual or a Christian. I saw some downside of just more and more and more and, and well. So the thought that we had was, this is a conversation with my wife and I before I started Bridgeway, well, we can give half away and then there will be less, you know, it won't be as big of a temptation because we won't have as much. And it was literally, not, to show you how naive that was, 10 years later I woke up and I'm like, this didn't work at all. The half, that I, the half that we have left over is now bigger than the hole that we would have had if, had we not put this in place. And I'm, I'm completely clear that that's a true statement. Does that true, would that be true for everybody? I don't know, but it's a very powerful concept. Mm -hmm. It's the only concept that I had in starting Bridgeway that I would say is tenfold more powerful than I had any clue when we put it in place as a rather naive um, concept and there weren't any real uh, business models to follow on that 22 years ago there are more now Bridgeway and a number of other companies that do give substantial. When you were uh, a grad student after you uh, come to um, know Christ were you a giver uh, personally at that point? Um, yes uh, I was in a um, like a Bible study uh, when we were in graduate school at MIT um, and so we were in small groups and there was the head of the small group and one of the things that they did was uh, encourage you to tithe. And, and they said, would you be willing to like share your budget? Do you have a budget? He's like, yeah, I'm a numbers guy, I've got a budget. Um, and our actual giving was way less than 10%. It was my first job, first full-time job. And they said, do you think you could do 10%? I, and literally, I just hadn't considered it before. And I don't think, I don't follow that like 10% is the number. Um, uh, but actually now I think it's low. <laughs> And, um, and I credit uh, that couple to like getting us quickly onto that uh, track. And what I will say about it, I, you know, I don't think this is everybody's experience, but it's been a source of extreme joy in my life from those early, early years and certainly today. It's like it's what it opens up in the world, um, being uh, generous is, is, is truly remarkable and you can start this at any income level and at any life stage. And, and, and generosity isn't just about money. It's time and spirit and um, a lot of other complicated things that interweave. What, um, so got a whole auditorium full of college students. If you could give them a bit of advice about cultivating a spirit of generosity in their life, what would you encourage them to do? Just begin. Um, people think that, like, in, in America, 
the conversation usually goes, well, I don't have a lot of resources right now, so when I get more resources, then I'll start you know, being more generous. Um, the actual statistics in the U.S. are the exact flip of that. If you take somebody that earns $12,000 a year, or something near minimum wage, those people give a higher percentage of their income than people, and it is a direct line right up. Hmm. So ask yourself, are you kidding yourself by saying you're going to wait? Hmm. Um, my, one of my kind of quotes that I like is, um, if you think, this is true with generosity, but it's, it's true of just making a difference with your life overall. If you think at age 20 that you're too young, that you don't have enough skills, um, that, that you don't know enough, um, that you don't have the network yet, then here's what I predict in, the rest, in, 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 in two other periods of your life. At, at age 40, what the, your conversation will be, how old are you? I'm 43. Michael. Okay, Michael's 43. So at age 40, close to Michael, you'll say, I have a mortgage, I have children, I need to save for college, I've got all these responsibilities, I'm too busy, and generosity of spirit and of money is not likely to happen at that life stage. At age 60, which is, I'm 60 this year, later this year, what you'll say is, I'm too old, people won't listen to me, it's too late. So think about that. If you can't do it at 20, you won't do it at 40, and you won't do it at 60. When in life, when does life start? It starts right now. So it's not too late at 43. It's not too late at 59. My mom's 92, and she's really kicking it. Um, uh, but, but encourage you to start. It's so much more powerful. And the actual finance side of this is hugely in favor of students. If you start saving and investing, and giving is my three-legged stool of that. Uh, at 20 or in your 20s, uh, it is wildly more powerful because of the compounding effect um, and the experience that you get in doing it from a young age. Um, and, and one of the things that you have as a young person is energy. Uh, if you're tied to the God that can move mountains, then you have all the power that you'll ever need. And, and in, 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 in the work that we do in um, fighting genocide, throughout history, some of the most powerful people have been people in their young 20s. Now think about that a second. Mm -hmm. The people that have affected the most change, that have stepped up in radical ways, some of the people that have been martyred as a result of that have been in their early 20s. Don't count out this life stage. It's a precious life stage. So John, I want to talk a little bit about the work you're doing to try and end genocide. Um, because uh, you're, you're very much on the front lines of that in some ways, and uh, there are ethical conundrums uh, for Christians that are involved in that. I, I think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who reached a conclusion um, in World War II that he was going to be involved in basically an assassination plot for Hitler, and when asked about it, how could you as a theologian take this action? And he said, well, so, so much of what we're trying to do is sort of... Um, help people after they've been rolled over by the wheels of injustice and to care for them, when in fact, what if it's our job to put a spoke in that wheel so that it actually stops rolling? So how, did you, how do you measure and weigh the moral calculus that's required to be involved with, frankly, the very dirty business of fighting genocide? Um, so I struggle with that question to this day. Um, I was... Um I was in the second year out of the end of the draft in the U.S. Um, for the Vietnam War, um, but I was, uh, I was still issued a draft number, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't absolutely clear, was it really going to end, and, and so um, I had to think about, am I a conscientious objector? Like, what I'm, I stand for peace, does that mean I'm willing to pick up a gun in, any, in any circumstances? And I will say I still struggle with that. I came to the understanding that I wasn't a conscientious objector and, and Hitler would have been an easy um, example of that if I had the opportunity to kill him and er eradicate um, the, uh, the atrocities, um, I would do that. Um, but I still see it as murder and the taking of human life and human life that was created by God. That's a, that's a very serious undertaking. So a soldier that takes that on to me is a person to be respected because we weren't created to kill. 
It, my, my eldest daughter's a PhD psychologist. Her, her, her um, area of specialty is post-traumatic stress disorder. She works for a VA hospital. She works with soldiers day in and day out. And I promise you, people were not created to kill and to come out just as normal, happy human beings. It's a lot of hard work to do so. Mm. Um, so I respect highly the people uh, that do it, that do it right. And by right, I mean um, are trained um, not to take advantage of, you know, looting and rape, uh, you know, as weapons of war and all of the other things. I think, I think you can be a Christian uh, and support uh, war, but I still struggle with it. So Bridgeway Foundation has been involved in trying to eradicate genocide for how many years? It's been in our mission statement since day one. Um, uh, Kim, who is the woman that came into my office with the five things that we should do, uh, that happened in 2004, so that's been 11 years that we've been more active. So uh, what difference have you seen in that 11-year time period since Bridgeway has gotten very involved in trying to eradicate genocide? Um, one of the things that I'm saddest about is how quickly we got, like I was expecting there were many, many more people, much more advanced, and there are some. Uh, there's some wonderful organizations that are more experienced than we are, um, but it's fewer and far, farther between um, than I expected. If you look at just the last three years, or say two, two and a half years in our um, efforts with other organizations, and, and I have to especially give um, the African Union uh, uh, forces huge credit. They're ones doing a lot of this hard work. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I you, lost your I was your asking about the success question. you've seen over those last oh, 11 years. So in, in the last two and a half years, uh, the number of killings, displacements, um, and, um, and uh, kidnappings by the LRA are down by 95 plus percent. So I'm that's, sorry, say that again, 95 percent? That's, that's pretty that's good big. success, John. Yes, it is. It is. It's amazing. Wow. Congratulations. Um, uh, so within that, um, you need to know that I'm just a normal guy. Um, I'm not like, I'm not brilliant. I, I somehow, I, well, I was the last guy off the waiting list into MIT. Um, uh, um, but I pray, uh, I believe that these things are possible, um, and I'm a part of a network with other people. Shannon Davis is, is our, um, the head of our foundation who takes um, much more um, personal risk and um, actually making things happen. Uh, I'm a person of vision, and I tell people, you know, if, if it just left up to me, uh, you'd have all these great ideas, but nothing would actually happen. Mm -hmm. So I surround myself with people that complement um, the skills that I uh, do have. One other uh, statistic for you on the LRA effort, of the, of the five generals, original generals, um, Coney executed one, because he didn't trust him anymore. Two died on the battlefield. Uh, about three months ago, a uh, fourth one surrendered himself um, to the African Union forces um, and is now stand, going to stand trial in The Hague, uh, the International Criminal Court. This, this, this last one is a, a, a life milestone for me. Hmm. When I heard that news, I cried. Hmm. Coney is the fifth one, and he's still at large. So that's progress. Um, it me I believe that there are people that are alive today because of the efforts of many people, um, certainly not just um, us, but Shannon is an amazing force to be reckoned with to help make things happen. I don't know if you're aware, but Shannon Sedgwick Davis is actually on the advisory council for the Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership here on our campus. So we, we share a connection and we share in the, uh, the partnership of wanting to try and help to do what we can to end the genocide. And one of the cool things is that John has agreed to meet with a small group of students uh, over lunch in the lion's den after Convo. So if you're interested in talking with him about his life work or the things that he's been involved in, he invites you to come and just join him for a casual conversation over lunch. Lots of questions are flowing in here, John. Um, tell us about uh, investing. If you have one bit of investing advice, how do I make money in the stock market? What do you say? Okay, um, I'm writing a book right now. The opening of the book is Wilma Green. Wilma Green was a housekeeper in California. She died at age 78 with over a million dollars. I mean, how does a housekeeper make a million dollars? So I went back and ran the numbers. If an individual making minimum wage saves 10% throughout any time 
any 78 years in the, in the last 115 years that I've seen data for, and you just saved 10% every day that you had a job, you'd end up with over a million dollars at age 78. And if that can happen for somebody on minimum wage, why are there not millionaires everywhere you look? Mm. Now, that's putting money in a low-cost index fund based on the stock market, very, very well diversified. You don't need to know more than that. Like, you don't need to take, sorry, Alice, a course in finance. <laughs> you don't need all you need. You don't need to be particularly smart. You don't need to follow the track. All you need to do is set up a program where day in and day out, it's called dollar cost averaging, you continue to invest small amounts. That's mm. my, that would be my formula for mm. personal finance. How about some questions coming in about uh, your own sort of uh, personal spiritual life? What habits have you cultivated that uh, have allowed you to remain both faithful and also to be successful? Hmm. So uh, the single most powerful thing that I do is pray unequivocally uh, as a leader or as an individual. Um, so my morning uh, devotional starts out with a rededication of my life. Um, part of that comes from uh, a book uh, and study called Experiencing God that some of you may be familiar with, which had a big impact on my life. Um, and, uh, and the last part of that dedication, dedication goes like this. Reveal to me, O oh Lord, what you're doing around me this day and give me the strength and commitment to join you. That was a transformation in how I thought about my life as a Christian. I used to think, you know, like, I've got these skills and abilities, so God, how can you use me? Period. This flips that on his head and says, forget about you. Like, John, this isn't about you, which is really not, for sure. Um, what's God doing? And, and when he reveals that to you, that's this amazing, exciting opportunity to join in. And that has been, that has been a, a, a difference. That's made a difference in my life. What do you hope that your uh, company and foundation uh, will be doing 10 years from now? Hmm. Well, um, we call uh, the core mission peacemaking, reconciliation, ending genocide. Um, so I'm thinking we're still uh, in line with that. I have a life vision of seeing the last genocide before I die. So 10 years out, probably I'm still um, at Bridgeway um, and seeing this. Uh, the non-core mission part is uh, areas that our partners, that's all the, the long-term committed people at Bridgeway, um, uh, basically their areas of passion and desire. So we talk about transformational change for our clients, for each other as partners, and for our communities, mm -hmm. um, and, and engaging in powerful ways. Uh, so if you come to work for Bridgeway, we actually expect, this is not a, a, you know, a nice thing to have, but we actually expect that you're going to engage somewhere powerfully in transformation, transformational change. And there are some, of, some people like education, some people are into microfinance, there are all different uh, kinds of, of ways to engage. And my role as a leader is to support people and nourish that, um, but we're serious about doing it at a ramped up level. Hmm. Uh, and that's one thing that I've, I've learned, um, again, just like I work with, Shannon is this amazing person. She's also like, she's a blonde mother of young children from Texas. Like, She's still an individual just out there committed and passionate and making a difference. And I think, I think anybody can do that. A couple of questions coming in wanting to know, what do you do as a college student to make yourself more prepared for um, getting a job at Bridgeway or getting the kinds of opportunities we want when we graduate? Um, okay, so I might answer this question uh, differently tomorrow, but what I'm thinking about right now is support and accountability. Um, putting that in place now so that when you make decisions to step out, and any new job is stepping out, um, you've got the support to do that. So a small network of friends that know about you, that are praying for you, that care about you, um, and then maybe a separate group even uh, who is literally holding you accountable. So the woman that walked into my office with the five things to do, she was holding me accountable. She said, this is what you said. Did you really mean it? Now I'm holding you accountable. As Christians, I think overall we do a lousy job of that. So at church, Bible studies, Sunday school, historically I've had, you know, it's like we do a great job of caring and supporting, but the accountability goes like this. 
Michael, if you don't hold me accountable, I promise not to hold you accountable. Like, there's that kind of <laughs> space. Uh, and that's upside down. That's not biblical, and it doesn't even make good business sense. Mm. So uh, being vulnerable in accountability, but having people that you trust and know care about you doing that, I think, is key. So I would be putting that in place today if you don't already have it. And I think maybe a number of you do. Um, I didn't have too much in my life. I didn't have the accountability at that high level. Hmm. Hmm. One of the things that we try to do at Gordon, uh, John, is to expose our students to people who are making a very significant difference in the world for the kingdom. And so uh, we're really pleased that you were able to come. I do hope you'll take advantage of the chance to uh, go to lunch with John and uh, hear a little bit more about what he's doing and to hear maybe how you could get uh, interested in it. And I want to thank you very much for being here with us. Please join me in thanking John McCain. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Let me also mention before you leave, let me also mention, I really do hope that you'll take advantage of the chance to say thanks to those folks who have made your education possible over in Lane and enjoy some uh, Founders Day cupcakes. You're dismissed. <laughs>